Thank you both for being with me. Um, before we start, I just want to acknowledge one sort of quirk in this discussion. Um, some of, the, some of the questions in this, some of our discussion, will be about that universe of colleges that are very selective. Uh -huh. And they won't apply to everyone. And that's in part because that's where so much of the fascination and frustration exists today. But I think other questions will go beyond that. And it's my hope that we scratch at some issues that transcend all sorts of schools, the whole diversity of them. I want to begin with something specific and maybe a little bit provocative, OK? Uh -huh. So a couple weeks ago, months ago, maybe the Times Reader Center asked graduating seniors who had just been through the college admissions process to write in and talk about their, uh, their good moments, their bad moments, um, and their bafflement at some of the way it works. Um, if you want to look at this uh, online, you can search it by looking for unvarnished tales of getting into college. Um, and it still lives online. And here's what one Asian American teenager wrote in. She said, as an overrepresented minority who grew up extremely poor, I was forced to overcome the hardest obstacles only to find out that I was still at an extreme disadvantage just because I was Asian. Perhaps colleges should move towards reforming affirmative action so that parental income is the prime factor in determining a student's disadvantage. Kay, what do you think? Well, actually, it reminds me of this story. Um, I was working with this one student, and she said to me, you know, I was saying, well, so what are you interested in, and what do you want to do? And she looked at me and she said, I want to get out of poverty. And I went, OK. So, um, so um, are they, is she disadvantaged because she's Asian? Um, I, yes, in some ways, only because uh, it, it, it intersects with poverty because she is, does not have the leeway. She doesn't have the connections. She did not do all those fancy things that colleges look for. So um, I do but think. But she's asking a question yes, beyond yes. herself, which yes, is, yes. Should, should, it be? should income more than race be looked at? I think both of them. I think both of them. Um, I certainly think that, that income is really important. Like, well, you know, Pell Grant people. Um, but I do believe pretty strongly in affirmative action. Yvonne? Well, I, I definitely think that um, both are important, and they play out differently in terms of the life experiences of students. There's commonalities between certain students and um, who've lived a similar socioeconomic path. I think that in our country, um, based on your race and ethnicity and your country of origin, there may be a different um, experience or path or opportunities or lack of opportunities that might be afforded to you. So I think that schools are taking income into consideration. Um, those especially that are doing holistic evaluation are looking or should be looking at the full context of the student and understanding what opportunities and what um, experiences they've had relative to that context. In, in what ways do you think the process is least meritocratic? Which, which students have the greatest unfair advantages in this process, and which students are at the greatest unfair disadvantage? You want to go first on this? Yeah, I'm happy to go first on that. Um, I mean, I think that I think here is where income uh, plays an advantage, and that um, well-off families, families that can pool, pay the full fare at any institution, will find a home, and oftentimes they will find not only a home, but may likely have monies given to them to attract them to, their, to an institution. Um, I think that from many institutions are trying to address uh, the students of the lowest income levels. And for them, uh, they're finding, students are finding that they're getting um, full fare of the full, the, or all tuition and cost, cost of attendance paid for. And so a lot of institutions, um, many uh, at sort of this private uh, level, are becoming bimodal. So I think it's the families in the middle, um, the families for whom they are able to pay some portion, but maybe not all, um, may, are, are finding themselves squeezed and, ch and challenged, and maybe are not able to meet that ideal of being able to go to the college they most want to go to. They're going to the college they most feel they can afford. What can we do about that? Well, I mean, I think we've talked a lot about it today in terms of uh, state and federal uh, uh, monies that go to, to pay and help assist for college. I mean, I think that was the great equalizer when you think about the GI Bill um, and, 
and then uh, the, the student loans. It was, it was an opportunity that allowed for families to be able to go. And then if you look at today the um, distribution of, of the costs of education and who's paying for them, it is skewing more towards families um, paying that full fare. And so I think many people are, are, are concerned that higher education is becoming unattainable, despite the great capacity that exists at the institutions that are here in this room. Um, and so I think some kind of financial model that's sustainable and realistic um, that can't um, be completely on the backs of the families. And if you look at how we compete higher education uh, systems between the US and other countries, they're often um, quite he heavily subsidized, if not fully, by federal governments and so forth. Kay, Kay in, in what ways that are perhaps fixable do you think the system is most unfair, the admission system? Well, I, I think that once um, many colleges get the applications, that they do a pretty good job of, uh, or certain ones, of looking at uh, each student, um, the, you know, the, the more selective ones. Um, getting those kids to the table, I think, is probably the hardest. Um, you know, in a school like mine, it's a small school. I work with every single person. But I'm in a very great position to be able to um, hear them and, and help each one get where they want. But there's some kids that just don't get to the table. They're, you know, they're, they're in huge schools, and there's just no way that anyone is giving them the kind of advice that they would need. So I think that that's probably the, the biggest um, lift. Are, are there some very concrete ways we could address that and try to get them that advice? Well, I, I mean, there is, there is a push, I think, for more counselors. Um, uh, and I think it's the federal government is, or someone is pushing that. Um, uh, and then there's, you know, there's groups like, like Posse and groups like Questbridge. The problems with Questbridge is that they are very geared. You can be a very high-performing student, but they're very good to SATs. I want to, yeah, I want to come back to tests in a moment, but I want to, uh, share something else from that unvarnished tales mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in which in which seniors themselves shared shared their thoughts with us um, a 17 year old who had gotten into University of Chicago nonetheless talked about the years leading up to that um, and how frustrating she found it that every year she would read news reports in which various colleges crowed about reaching their lowest acceptance <laughs> rate ever um, and she wrote don't advertise that you're crushing more dreams <laughs> Yvonne in all seriousness is, are there things that institutions that are very selective like Rice are doing, perhaps unintentionally, to exacerbate this sense of, of winners and losers, insiders and outsiders? I mean, I, I agree, and this I agree with her because it, it does sort of allow for um, students to feel um, left out, uh, perhaps, uh, from institutions that they would have would have liked to or feel that they would have liked to have attended. I've, had, I've been in circles with the elite institutions and I had a director of admissions share with me that if tomorrow she can just you know, no, no longer receive any more applications, I would be perfectly fine with that. My problem there is that if we were to shut down our recruitment, then only the students and families that knew about our institutions would um, know to apply and know what the opportunities that were available to them. And so I see my purpose is um, promoting and sharing what the value of the Rice education is, and I believe in it. And I know working with my colleagues on the campus about ways in which we can make it more affordable, ways that we can make ensure that students are successful and completing. And, and, and we are in a rarefied place. We have, you know, we, we have um, great riches relative to perhaps some other institutions, but I think that holds the bar higher for us to be able to achieve that. Now, whether it's addressing your question about making it more um, exacerbating the, the anxiety, um, yeah, I don't know that I know the solution to that other than just explaining more and trying to be as transparent as you can about what it is that you value. And, and, that, and that moving away from um, this sense of entitlement to a position, a spot at an institution, um, versus uh, as an opportunity that perhaps 
a student would, um, would, would be able to uh, take advantage of. I can tell you coming from Southern California at a suburban high school that nobody in my high school felt entitled to a spot at an Ivy League school. It was a gift. It was a great opportunity for those of us that were able to, to go. Okay, there, there are many people in this audience who represent schools that aren't worried about how to choose between various iterations of the creme de la creme, but mm -hmm. are facing declining enrollment. Mm -hmm. How do they reach the students you're advising um, and make the case, which is true, that they have enormous things to offer those students? How do they, how do they sell themselves to those students? Money. I mean, you know, it's, it's, if, you, if you are not, uh, the families will say to me, we'll pay if, if they can get into Rice, but we're not going to pay for this one. So there's that problem. Um, there's a problem, I mean, there's so many great schools. I tend to, um, if they are in a position where money is really an issue, and money almost always is an issue, um, I talk about the SUNY schools, and I talk about the CUNY schools. So if there's a state school um, that is you know, three times the amount of money, I'm, I, you know, I'm very wary of saying, you know, well, you should take a look at that. Now, some of the smaller private schools, I think, are terrific. And I try to, and I do bring them up. And you know, I, um, so if they can't get into Amherst and Swarthmore, I have a lot of them, if, if they can articulate and we can come to kind of some kind of agreement with what sorts of schools they want, I have a lot of them that I will push as excellent schools. The, the rise of the Common App has led to this phenomenon which we read about and it's true of students applying to 20, 30, mm -hmm. 40 schools. Um, should schools themselves be requiring more add-ons so you can't just keep pressing the button? Or should there be some other mechanism by which, is there some plausible mechanism by which the number of schools a student applies to could be limited? Well, I, I think, um, I think the, the numbers you, you suggested are the exception. Yeah. We've done our own research just this year on our applicants to Rice, and we found that those applying from out of state applied to, on average, seven schools, and those from in state applied to, on average, between three and four schools. And so there are different behaviors in terms of how students are applying. And then you also hear the stories of the student applied to every single Ivy League school and no others and didn't get in anywhere. So there is this element of choice that I think we value as Americans that we don't want to limit, but it's choice within reason. And it's choice within, um, uh, within some realistic set. And, and that's where our guidance counselors come in and play a critical and very important role. And while it's true that some of our public school students don't have that opportunity, I think it's incumbent upon institutions to step in and provide some of that guidance around the process to demystify it, to reduce the anxiety, to, to provide um, support and help okay. along the way. Well, a, a couple of things happen, and, and going back to your last question about, you know, they have 3%, 5% acceptance. One of the things that colleges, I really feel, can do is stop telling kids that they should apply to their school and they have no cutoffs, and they're going to look at every child. And you, you know, think that's a, a lie? Oh, I know it's a lie. <laughs> I this mean, is it, the whole recruit to deny phenomenon, right? Yeah, I, you know, it's it's, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of, um, you know, they say, oh yes, we're going to look at you. Well, I tell my kids it's a lie. I'm sorry, <laughs> um, because um, I tell my kids, apply in your range. Apply in your range, unless you know you're like, uh, you know, a world-class athlete. Apply in your range, and uh, but you know we have this college fair, and the, and they say the the the, uh, the reps say, oh, we'll look at everything. It doesn't matter. You have you have a 200 on your SAT and a GPA of 72. Not a problem. <laughs> we might be able to accept you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a moral and ethical element of how you recruit and who, to whom you recruit. I do agree that there are, in fact, institutions that aren't looking at um, 
uh, candidates, or they say that every student came to committee and they're bringing a list, so your name was there, but there wasn't a discussion. And I think that's really what led to some of the work that we did at Penn and now at Rice, and it's happening at, another, at many other institutions, of rethinking how you can do the approach of evaluating applications, because I very much believe in the commitment and that we will evaluate every candidate and read through their story. Now, granted, it goes fast, but we're professionals. I can read and decipher a transcript in seconds that would take people a couple of minutes to understand what's being conveyed. But you're still asking them for them. Do you we know? Start, yeah. You know, I mean, I think that that's the problem. It's not, I, I know you're professional, and, and I do know that, that the schools bring in great candidates. However, um, you know, when I have a kid who has a 72 and she says, you know, I'm, I'm going to apply to Columbia because, you know, my mom wants me to. I don't really want to go. And I said, I wouldn't worry about it. But still, <laughs> they're, you know, they are, they are actually recruiting them. They're actually saying things to them. We don't have cutoffs. And I know you put out your range of, of who they accept. But when people talk to them, and these are kids. These are kids, and you tell them you have a chance. They think, I have a chance. So, um, you know, it's... Yeah, I mean, it's difficult because... Um, I agree. There are students who apply that I wonder why on earth did they think to apply this, that there's really nothing here, and the grades are just really, yeah. really concerning about whether or not they will be successful. And at the end of the day, that's what it's about is whether or not this student's gonna be successful within my curriculum. And keeping in mind that you also don't want to shut the door. You don't want to make it all about test scores because it's important for Can us. Can I put in something because I, I want to run out of time. Yeah. You mentioned test scores. More and more students are going test, and more and more schools are going test optional. Sure. Is that a positive development, a negative development, or neutral? I find it very positive. Um, the only uh, correlation in success and, and test scores um, is first year um, um, performance. And that's you, you, because the bigger schools actually give more multiple choice tests. So, you know, it's, it's and when you go on, it, it's not predictive at all. It's not predictive at all. So I think using it is, is, is difficult. As far as it being optional, you know, look, I know what they're doing and, and if, you know, the kids asked me, so should I send my uh, SAT scores in? I said, if they're below their average, no. And if they're above their average, yes. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. But whether or not schools are playing it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say that one size doesn't fit all. And I think that the important way to, to approach considering test scores is to do the research for your students and how they perform at your school. I feel that I was a beneficiary of the SAT. I came from the first graduating class of my high school, brand new school, and I showed excellence in mathematics, and I wanted to major in math. And so I, I don't know how the admissions committee could have considered me without knowing the curriculum, without knowing my high school, but a signal. Mm -hmm. It was just a signal, and it wasn't the totality of my story. And so, um, you know, I think we have to, to take it with some consideration. They aren't the be-all, end-all, but they, in, in the institutions that I've worked at, it's shown that they are predictive beyond just first year, first semester grades. Um, and so it's one of these things where we're, uh, we're obligated as institutions, if we're going to use them, if we're going to ask for any of these, whether it's teacher recommendations, transcripts, that we find them valuable and meaningful in the process. So. One last quick question to each of you, and then we'll go to the audience. Um, Kay, if you were supreme ruler of the universe and you could change three things about the way colleges do admissions, what would those three things be? They would not look at the rigor of a uh, curriculum depending on APs uh, because what it does is it makes students, young, young students, take courses they could care less about. And then when they go to their colleges, they don't care. So that was one. Um, so they wouldn't consider that. They would not, um, I'm like this on SATs. I'm like this, I'm not as, as um, down on SATs, but I like optional. See, you could have, have shown them your high SAT if it was optional, and you would have, uh, have, have gotten that, you know, kick from that. Maybe. If you were supreme <laughs> I don't know that I was above the average. <laughs> if, you, if you were supreme ruler of rice, three yeah. things you'd change in its admissions practices tomorrow. 
Well, I think I know that um, admissions offices are overworked and 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 find themselves um, strapped because of the volumes or the riches of their success of, in recruitment, if you want to call applications success. I think one of the things that we're doing at Rice right now is looking in, inwardly to assess, and we did a strategy project to consider where is the state of Rice admissions today and what could we be doing? And, and it's around creating processes, creating structure to enable us to do the things we'd like to do, which is be more transparent about our process, to be more guidance and counseling as it relates to admissions to, to Rice. Um, and so I think that enabling us to have more capacity to do more work. So. Okay, let's get, get some questions from the audience now. Um, can we bring the house lights up a little? Well, actually, we have one here um, on the screen. We'll start there. From Catherine Hill at Ithaca SNR, isn't the real problem that most schools that are selective reject students based on need because colleges and universities don't want to make the hard decisions about allocating resources to need-based aid? There are a selection of institutions that are need blind. And again, it's often institutions with um, significant resources. I think that ideally at more resource straps inst institutions, they go through and look at the population of candidates and identify the class that they want. And then at the end realize that it, they may not be able to afford that class. And here's where I talked about that this, it, the students who can pay the full fare, get that advantage and shaping the class to the end. I actually like need aware better because um, a lot of schools are need blind, but then they gap the kids. Um, so, you know, they say, sure, you can come uh, and we're gonna give you $20,000. And when you tell a 17 year old you get $20,000, they are really excited until someone says, how about the other 40,000? So. <laughs> Right, so there's need blind, and then uh, oftentimes that same set of schools are need-based financial aid, so they, they aim to meet full need. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not every institution that no. can do that, so no. it's challenging. Yeah, yeah. Have I have another good one here, but is there someone from the audience that we're overlooking? Yeah. Yes, one right here. The last here. Uh, David Muller from Mount Sinai School of Medicine here, Frank. Wow. Sorry. Um, so one of the profoundly detrimental effects on medical school admissions are rankings, U.S. News and World Report rankings in particular. Um, to what extent are rankings one of the sins of admission in higher ed education? If they are, what should we be doing about it? I think they are, because I think that they may cause um, institutions to value certain things over others in order to, um, to uh, increase the rankings of that institution. Um, and it really is, I mean, the college experience is a personal journey. And, and so in some ways, rankings don't, aren't relevant because you're looking for the right or right set of institutions for you that which the student can thrive in. Um, so, it, you know, there's one element with regards to the research and the quality of the faculty, but the undergraduate experience can be another, another part of it. If, if I'm, why not the 20 top ranked schools in U.S. News and World Report simply say we're not playing anymore, we're pulling out? They wouldn't suffer reputationally for a uh -huh. nanosecond, and it might bring the whole rankings game down. Yeah. I think that's a good Does question. Does that ever get discussed? Well, you can't because then you're colluding, and, and oh. the schools <laughs> were, <laughs> were brought word, to the that, Supreme Court about I was that. Say that, that, so. word, <laughs> that word collusion comes up so infrequently these days in American life. Yeah. Let's ask another one from here. From Peter Taylor, president of ECMC Foundation, and unfortunately, this is going to be our last one. Does the practice of legacy admissions exacerbate economic class divisions and thereby undermine the nation's confidence in the higher education system? Kay, why don't you start with that and then we'll um, You know, I know that certain schools, um, I think that Yale, for instance, um, um, devalues legacy. They, they do not use it at all. Um, so I think that's also school by school. Uh, some schools use it, some schools don't. Um, Sure, you know, nepotism is, is, makes you think that it is certainly against any kind of equality. I think it's a factor, and one of the challenges that as enrollment managers that we're trying to, to manage is the students who will say yes, and the students who will actually come, and the students who have an understanding of our institutions. And so, while it's not all legacy candidates, there are some for whom they really understand and, and desire to have that similar experience. But I, I think it's just a factor among many, but shouldn't be the determining factor and, the, and, and a complete 
you know, edge across, you know, other things and areas of consideration about the student and their readiness for the college. We are out of time, but thank you both for your time and thank, thank you. you all. <laughs> oh, thank you.